This is Burlington, and here we are in the Channel 17 newsroom at the Center for Media and Democracy. And this is our ongoing series, Nuclear Free Future Conversation. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington. And viewers, let's welcome our guest, Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds Energy Education here in Burlington, Vermont, the chief engineer for Fairwinds Energy Education and the newly appointed community fellow for the University of Vermont, community research fellow for the University of Vermont. Yeah, hi, Margaret. It's nice to be back from Japan and sitting yes. here with you today. Yes, and you were just telling me about the, uh, what you saw in Japan in, in your, your last speaking tour. So the, our title is Vermont Yankee, uh, I mean, Fukushima at five and the Vermont Yankee decommissioning. What do they mean? So we're drawing the two subjects together. But to, to start it off, t please tell us your impressions yeah. there. Um, you know, the, there's a couple of impressions. The first is the, the people in Japan and in Fukushima Prefecture are wonderful, like people all over the world. But the inhumanity of the Japanese government and the uh, nuclear industry toward the people is just overwhelming. I was so uh, surprised that, you know, they're forcing these people back into radiation areas. And um, it, it used to be that the old limit for an acceptable radiation dose was, um, was one millisievert. And to get people to go back, they actually raised the limit 20 times higher to 20 millisieverts, and they're saying it's safe. Well, right before the accident, one was safe, and now to get people back, they've, they've, they've raised the bar. So they're exposed to 20 times more radiation than they would have been. Um, it's, it's really, really awful. And are people being forced to go back to the Fukushima area? Well, what they're doing, the, the people that were... Um, forced to leave are living in resettlement areas and uh, they're saying that um, and they're on a stipend and uh, they're saying well if you want to continue your stipend you've got to go home if you want to stay here you can but we're not going to pay you anymore so they have no job and they have you know they've, they've, they've lost their source of income uh, so they're being forced home um, into high radiation areas because uh, they're, um, uh, they're taking their, their, their ability to eat away. You know, they're not being paid. Yeah, it's sad. Yeah. And you had the opportunity to speak to several people there. I met with, uh, uh, in one of the resettlement areas, and uh, I met with uh, 22 women who were uh, there that day. And there, there's 66 of these uh, small buildings. Think of almost uh, about the size of a trailer, if not even mm -hmm. smaller. Um, so one third of this little village came out to talk to us for, oh, I don't know, three or four hours. Mm -hmm. One of the, uh, the unofficial mayor of this group, uh, um, the real the dynamo of a woman, um, she had, uh, she experienced hair loss, uh, bloody nose, speckles on her skin, and the, uh, uh, the doctors told her it was stress and not to worry about it. That's not stress. It was radiation damage. Um, but again, that's this inhumanity that, I'm, that I was experiencing. You know, the, the, uh, uh, the government and the people associated with the government are, uh, are singing one song. And it's not what the data suggests. You know. I, was, I, I climbed all over the hills and valleys of Fukushima. Uh, we followed radioactive monkeys, and we uh, we caught their uh, their droppings and put them into radiation meters, and they're highly radioactive. We had uh, hunters kill uh, wild boar, and they're highly radioactive. So the entire mountain range. Think of from Middlebury to the uh, to the border with Canada, from Lake Champlain all the way up to Mount Mansfield and over the other side. Uh, is highly contaminated. And every time they clean one little area, it gets dirty again because it comes down, gets radioactively dirty again because it all comes out of the mountain and, 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 and settles back into all these places. Arnie, what you're describing is a terrain like, very much like Vermont. It reminded me a lot of Vermont. You know, it was a, a lot of rural areas, a couple cities. Uh, 
you know, there's 70,000 people that still can't go home. So that's essentially two Burlingtons. And so you're driving through these uh, roads and you come upon these ghost towns. You know, think of Burlington as a ghost town. And there would be essentially two of them. Uh, it's, um, it, it was really an eye-opener for me. And when, when you spoke to this woman in particular and to the others, were they used to being listened to? They told us, the 22 women on that, that particular day told us that we were the first people in five years to talk to them about radiation. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Tokyo Electric didn't talk to them, the government didn't talk to them. Uh, we were the first. And we said, well, where do you get your information from? And they said they get it from Tokyo Electric and the government because those are the only sources that they, they have available. So um, it was... That was just an eye-opener. Every time I turned around, I saw uh, people that definitely experienced radiation damage. We had one woman who uh, ran from her house uh, to evacuate, carrying her dog. Um, about a day after the accident, they realized that uh, she needed to be evacuated. And so she runs barefoot to her car, gets in her car, drives to the resettlement community. She's highly radioactive. Um, they make her, especially her feet, um, they make her take her socks off and you know, take showers and wash her down before they let her in. And her feet were black for three years from radiation damage. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not being spoken about in any of the medical journals. We had a doctor, uh, Dr. Medi, um, who said that he had a, a thriving clinic and whenever he treated somebody, he would put, you know, what the cause was. And if it was radiation, he put radiation on the treatment slips. And uh, the, the Japanese government refused to pay him for any of the radiation uh, illnesses that he was diagnosing. And he went out of business. He lost his clinic. So, and I mean, what is the, what is the uh, purpose that, of the government not doing that? Is that that they don't want to acknowledge that there is radiation damage to the people? Yeah, it's, it's money. You know, they want to get these other nuclear plants up and running. And if the population is uh, getting ill from radiation effects, it's a lot harder. So they have, they've really banded together with the medical community. And um, we had numerous doctors say that they were going to lose... Um, hospital privileges and you know, things like that. Um, and the, uh, the people that are keeping track of death, deaths in Fukushima Prefecture um, aren't publishing the data. So the entire government infrastructure from the, you know, the, the people in Tokyo to the, the underlings in the prefecture are all singing the same song. That this is stress, there's no radiation, and uh, it sure isn't what I found, I'll tell you. And in a sense, they are winning, right, by, by obliterating the real story. Were it not for the Internet, they would have won. Uh, uh -huh. uh, and I think the difference between the, the, the disaster of Fukushima and the disaster at Chernobyl and TMI is that now we have the Internet. Uh, it still is an unlevel playing field. You know, there's still so much money on the other side of it, that uh, uh, the, the people are being brainwashed. That uh, oh, that bloody nose you've had for the last three weeks is uh, stress. You know, uh, so they are being brainwashed. But they do have a lot of them who have access to the internet do have an alternative to uh, uh, to counter whatever it is the Japanese government is is throwing out there. You know, it's follow the money. We, we've, we've said that before in Vermont Yankee. We've said it. It's, there's a lot of money at stake here, and uh, the people's lives be damned. And the money is being put toward the development of new nuclear power reactors in Japan? Well, they had, they had 54 nuclear plants before the disaster, and they immediately lost four, Fukushima 1, 2, 3, 4. Right. Uh, another 10 or 15 will likely never start up because uh, they shouldn't have been running in the first place. They were so old and so dangerous. But there's about 30 plants that uh, the government desperately wants to get back up. And the banks want it too. Because what's happened is while these plants have been shut down for the last five years, the staffs are continue to being paid so that they... Um, 
you know, when I borrow money from the bank, I've got to have collateral. You know, mm -hmm. if I buy a car, I've got to, they've got to have the, the, the title. Yeah. Well, the banks are not just giving this money to these uh, utilities. There's got to be a tacit agreement that we know you're going to start that plant back up. So there's a lot of pressure from the banks and the utilities on the government to, uh, to turn these plants back on. And there's a global pressure too, right? I think so. Yeah. I, I, I definitely think that uh, General Electric here in, in the states is applying pressure to our State Department to uh, encourage the Japanese to get these nukes up and running again. And how is the NRC playing into to this? Because uh, in Vermont, we have Vermont Yankee has been closed. And so for a lot of us, it's out of our minds. I mean, it's not in our mind anymore because uh, the press isn't covering it. It's sitting there. And uh, all I saw recently was that there might be a, a fracked gas pipeline somewhere near near the carcass of Vermont Yankee to supply energy down there. Mm -hmm. and you know, so that's going to be difficult to do because there's a, there's a radioactive power plant on that site. And it's not as if you can uh, uh, open a plant unless you've dismantled the one that's there. So I, I think that uh, uh, what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is doing right now is, is frantically trying to change the regulations to make it easier for Entergy to strip money out of the fund. And there, there, there used to be a decommissioning trust fund, and now it's turning into a slush fund. And anything Entergy wants to take out of it, the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission says, sure, no problem. Um, so I'm afraid that we're draining the fund and, uh, and the money isn't being well spent. Uh, we've been talking with Doug Hoffer, you know, the state auditor, and uh, he's really interested in how, as a state auditor, he can watch this fund to make sure the money's being properly spent. Uh, and I'd like to get the state auditors all around the country to do this too, because Vermont Yankee is just the first to go through this, but there's going to be, you know, a hundred more, and we, we can be the test case that... Um, the, uh, establishes rules that protect you and I and not the owners of these power plants. Um, left to their own desires, I think the Nuclear Regulatory Commission would just, you know, give the money to these, uh, the owners of the power plants. And uh, 60 years out, when there's, uh, when there's still a carcass of a plant sitting there, it's you and I that are going to get stuck, and our grandkids, that are going to get stuck on the, paying the bill. Now, you mentioned that whatever the, what is the name of the regulatory commission in Japan that just gave the, the go-ahead to, to up the radiation dose that people can get? Yeah, they call it the NRA, uh, okay. but it's not National Rifle Association, yeah. it's Nuclear Regulatory Association or agency, maybe. Um, but it's, it's comparable to the NRC here, right? Well, I'd, I'd like to believe that, but what's happening now is that the very conservative Abe administration, Abe is the right. uh, prime minister, is replacing all of the neutral people on that commission, on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, with people that want to start nuclear power back up. So over the five years that it was running so far, it was reasonably objective and a, and a pretty good watchdog. But in the last six, seven months, uh, any of the people on that, uh, on that commission who really felt that nuclear plants should be properly regulated are being thrown off the commission and being replaced with, uh, with people. Actually, these guys have actually been paid by Tokyo Electric, and now they're on the board overseeing Tokyo Electric. Not objective at all. This is called the revolving door, right? Yeah, we know. have it here too. Yeah. You know, I, when I was in Japan, I kept telling people that, uh, you know, don't think that the the Japanese system caused Fukushima and it couldn't happen anywhere else. America got lucky. Mm -hmm. It didn't have. We have we have uh, 23 plants just like Fukushima, including Vermont Yankee, including Pilgrim over in Massachusetts. Um, 
And um, that one of those didn't fail catastrophically isn't because we're better, it's just because we're lucky. Yeah. Arnie, you have called the Fukushima uh, triple meltdown the greatest industrial accident ever. Mm -hmm. How is it, how does it comp compare to Vermont Yankee and the, the going forward with the carcass of Vermont Yankee and the other decommissioned nuclear power plants? Well, to turn Vermont Yankee back into a greenfield to uh, make it so it could be farmed or, or there could be a gas plant there or there could be condos with a riverfront, whatever, to turn it back into a greenfield um, at Vermont Yankee would cost about a billion dollars. Um, Fukushima is going to cost $500 billion to clean up. Mm. So, you know, the, the disaster has, has, you know, imagine contaminating the Green Mountains mm. and then trying to send people in with, uh, with shovels to clean it out. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what they're trying to do. I have never seen more dump trucks and construction vehicles in my life. They have... Um, they, they put the nuclear waste into bags, and the bags are a cubic meter, and they weigh a ton. And there's 30 million of these bags. Everywhere you go, there's these piles and piles of bags full of radioactive material. And maybe they've cleaned 5 or 10% of the prefecture, but they can't get into the mountains. So what happens is every time you have a, a storm, or every time the, uh, the now we've got the seeds you know, the, the roots are bringing up the radiation into the seeds, and this time of year in Japan, the seeds are blowing in the wind. So these towns are becoming recontaminated with the stuff that's in the mountains. And 90% of the radiation is up there in the mountains. What are they going to do with the plastic bags? Um, I, they are asking that question. They're talking about incineration. Um, but my problem with that is that you know, all of this radiation now is going to be re-volatilized. It's going to go right back up into the, uh, into the atmosphere. So essentially we'll have a, a second Fukushima because we'll be blowing this stuff up into the sky again. Um, they claim that they're, uh, they'll trap it all in, inside the incinerator. Uh, but the measurements I took show that that's not happening. Mm. Arnie, we're going to to show the video that you made in 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 Japan uh, at the a, at the end of our program here and so I would like you to segue us into that and uh, I was very moved in seeing it and I'm sure that people will be enlightened about the truth of what's going on mm -hmm. when they, when they see this well we were asked by uh, several groups that wanted to uh, have a retrospective. What, what's gone on at, at Fukushima Daiichi in the last uh, five years? We've been at, we were asked back in January to put together a, uh, a video. So uh, in January, before I left, we, we went back and, um, and, and found all the old newspaper clips and stories about uh, what our government was saying. You know, for instance, the Department of uh, Energy was saying that. Uh, uh, don't worry, it's not anywhere near as bad as uh, Chernobyl, and in fact, it's probably like Three Mile Island, not a big deal. And I was on television five years ago saying, baloney, this is the worst industrial accident in the history of mankind. So what we were able to do is to weave back in uh, all of the things that Fairwinds has said over the last five years, uh, basically refuting what the, what the government claimed. And I think it's been, uh, it was an eye-opener for me uh, because, you know, I came to that conclusion that the American government has been trying to cover up Fukushima and, the, you know, the costs of, of, of Vermont Yankee and all this stuff. Uh, we, we are no better than the, than the Japanese as far as the, uh, the callous disregard we have for, um, uh, for people uh, compared to the... Uh, uh, the worshiping, essentially, of, of profit. Right. Can you, uh, can you tell us what the, the profit game is? Like, who are the, who are the nuclear uh, bigwigs? <laughs> you know, 
Wall Street is really not interested in funding any new nuclear. Mm. So you know, it, it is a dying industry, but there's still a hundred nuclear plants out there, and uh, uh, most of them are licensed to run 60 years, and now they're all applying to run for 80 years. So they were designed for 40, and their licenses were extended by 20, and now they're all going back in to get another 20. So there's uh, you know a hundred plants out there. The big guys are Entergy, uh, which is uh, uh, actively uh, uh, funding Hillary Clinton's campaign, and because um, they're a southern utility, and of course she's from the south, mm-hmm. and Exelon, and Exelon actively funded Barack Obama's campaign. Um, so that, uh, and then there's a bunch of smaller actors, but between Entergy and Exelon, they own 35 of 100. You know, those two are the big guys. Um, and uh, they want to keep that asset churning out electricity for as long as they can. They paid next to nothing. You know, the Vermont Yankee was uh, less than $200 million, and to build a new nuclear plant is is probably $20 billion. So they got a real, real bargain on it um, and, and other plants around the country. So they want to keep these bargain basement plants running for as long as they can to make as much as they can from them. Um, Wall Street is putting pressure on them not to do it again. Don't build another one. That's a, that's a, a, you've got to have a death wish to build a new nuclear plant. But uh, uh, if, if there's a way to keep a nuclear plant operating, they're going to find it, and, and it's frightening because, uh, you know, think about an 80-year-old car. Uh, can, even with the best of maintenance, is that something you drive down the highway full full speed? And the answer is no. But yet, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission allows it to happen for for power plants. And meanwhile, as you mentioned, we the taxpayers are funding this. The government money mm-hmm. that goes into these power plants is the taxpayer money. Well, you know, the General Accounting Office did a study over the last 70 years. Um, nuclear power has gotten half of all of the energy subsidies uh, that the Department of Energy has given out. And then uh, oil and gas have gotten a quarter, and then the electric grid and solar and renewable, and everything else has gotten another quarter. So the the Half of this pie over 70 years has been the nuclear um, in direct subsidies. But now what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is doing is uh, granting exemptions. And an exemption is like if, if you want to go 100 miles an hour down Route 89, you call the NRC and say, hey, I want to go 100. And they'll say, sure. Okay. So they basically are, are ignoring the regulations and allowing utilities to do whatever they want. And the net effect of that is that nuclear appears to be cheaper than it really is. If it had to compete for, on price, more nuclear power plants would shut down. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is propping them up by making their uh, costs lower than they really should be. Arnie, let's go into the video now, and uh, we'll we'll say goodbye for now Is in our live program here and uh, please come back again for the, to continue your your wonderful research findings with, with us continue enlightening us thank you so much and and could you just segue us into the the video well okay. we thank the viewers for watching and please watch this video you will learn a lot from it and and you will you will get active when you see this yeah, you know, the Abe administration said back four or five years ago that uh, Fukushima was not a problem. And in the process, it got the uh, Olympics brought there. Um, they basically made the problem disappear. But it, the problem didn't disappear. You know, we were looking at uh, newspaper coverage in the last couple of weeks, and uh, it's clear that the plant continues to hemorrhage. So what, what we were able to do is put together a five-year retrospective that, um, that shows that all of the lies that the Abe administration made in order to get the Olympics were wrong and that it should have uh, 
uh, the Olympics never should have been uh, been chosen for Japan because the the entire country and especially the North is quite highly contaminated. Thank you, Arnie, and All thank right. you, Free Speech TV, because you're not getting this in mainstream media. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. <laughs> Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson, Chief Engineer and Board Member for Fairwinds Energy Education. It's March 2016, and five years ago this month, the triple meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi began. Maggie and I and the Fairwinds crew have received many questions about how this disaster began, its current status, and what the future after such a major catastrophe may look like for the Daiichi site, for Fukushima Prefecture, and for the people of Japan. All of us at Fairwinds created this video to answer your questions and share the truth about the ongoing tragedy at Fukushima Daiichi. First, let's look at why this disaster happened at all. Many of you know that in addition to the public information work we do with the nonprofit Fairwinds Energy Education, we work together as a paralegal services and an expert witness firm that Maggie founded in 2003 named Fairwinds Associates. During the first quarter of 2011, we were working on several cases and uncovering a number of significant safety issues at very different plants here in the U.S. One night after a dinner walk only three weeks prior to Fukushima Daiichi disaster, Maggie said, you know, we look at a lot of aging nukes and we're uncovering so many safety risks. Arnie, what do you think the next radioactive disaster will be? He said, I'm not sure where it will be, but I'm sure it will be in a General Electric Mark I boiling water reactor. Unfortunately, I was right. The Fukushima Daiichi Atomic Reactor is a GE Mark I boiling water reactor design. If you listen to the mainstream media, you might believe that these three atomic reactor meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi are strictly a problem produced in Japan. That is absolutely wrong. All of the major design decisions at Fukushima Daiichi were made in the USA, including placing the diesels in the basement and ignoring the 2,000 year history of huge tsunamis. The atomic reactor itself was designed by General Electric in San Jose, California, while the entire Unit 1 power plant was designed and constructed by Ebasco, located in downtown Manhattan. Today, in the United States, there's 23 atomic reactors identical to those still in meltdown at Fukushima Daiichi. The atomic power industry would have you believe that the Japanese nuclear program is somehow inferior to the U.S. counterpart. Moreover, it wants you to believe that such a catastrophe could not happen in the U.S. And once again, the nuclear industry is absolutely wrong. All of the mechanical problems that cause the equipment malfunctions at Fukushima Daiichi are also present in each of the 23 GE Mark I boiling water reactors here in the United States. But more importantly, the same engineers that designed 100 atomic reactors here in the U.S. used the same skills to design the six reactors at the Daiichi site. And finally, the people we're supposed to trust to regulate the United States plants the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or the NRC, have been compromised by the atomic power industry just like the Japanese regulators were. Japanese technology is not inferior to U.S. atomic technology, and the regulation of Japan's nuclear power and materials industries are not less regulated than those we have here in the U.S. For that matter, several U.S. plants are in such decrepit condition and also located in earthquake faults or downstream from leaking dams, that it is only dumb luck 
that none of Americans' atomic power plants have suffered meltdowns since the 1979 disaster at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. For more than 40 years, both American and Japanese engineers have been absolutely aware of the many design flaws that caused the meltdown and accompanying explosions at Fukushima Daiichi. Senior managers at the Atomic Energy Commission, the regulatory precursor to the NRC, expressed grave concerns about the GE Mark I containment design as early as 1972. Subsequently, in 1985, a report issued by the NRC identified that if a meltdown occurred, there was a 90% probability that the Mark I containment would explode. Afterward, another NRC report from the 80s showed that General Electric's entire reactor design was more prone to a meltdown than other atomic reactors because it was designed with many holes in the bottom of each reactor to facilitate the movement of the control rods required to slow down and stop the atomic chain reaction. These control rods significantly weakened the floor of each GE boiling water reactor. And finally, again in the 80s, NRC reports indicate that GE and NRC knew that the high pressures, the high temperatures, the high radiation levels after a nuclear meltdown would cause the plumbing and the electrical conduits in each of the containments to fail totally, thereby allowing groundwater to leak into the molten core. The ongoing disaster at Fukushima Daiichi simply proves these early engineering analyses from the 70s and the 80s were absolutely correct. Not one safety system operated as it was designed, and consequently, massive amounts of radiation continue to enter Japan's water and air and bleed into the Pacific Ocean daily. No one in the atomic power industry wants to discuss why these reactors were operated for 40 years knowing that they were ticking time bombs, and why dozens of similar reactors are even allowed to operate today. You've heard me say it before here at Fairwinds, follow the money. Quite simply, the atomic power industry and its regulators put the interests of investment bankers, atomic power and weapons brokers, and the government eager to retain atomic capability ahead of our public health and safety. It was obvious back in 2011 that these poorly designed and aged reactors that are sitting in an earthquake zone would continue to bleed radiation into the Pacific. Clearly, leaking radioactivity will be an ongoing phenomena for decades at least. Here's what I said when I was one of the first to identify this leakage back in 2011. The building, that box, is called a reactor building, and inside that is the containment. And um, as pressure started to build up in units one and unit three, they vented the hydrogen gases into the reactor building, and that's what blew up. And that the, the uh, dramatic pictures of the explosion were of the reactor building. Um, underneath that rubble is the containment. But in the building that's intact, they didn't vent it in time, and they had a hydrogen detonation inside the containment. And that's kind of like sneezing with your mouth closed and your nose pinched. It's going to pop your eardrums. Well, what happened on Unit 2 is that as a result of that explosion, the containment itself broke. And so now radioactive liquids are leaking out of the containment into that trench. I'm going to shrink this down for a second. I want to come back to the pictures in a minute. But for now, I want to just talk about how much water. Because the company says 11,500 tons of radioactive water. We're not minimizing this at all. Going into the Pacific Ocean, that's about enough water to fill five large swimming pools. The Pacific Ocean, as you can see, this is, in terms of the volume of the Pacific Ocean, Mr. Gunderson, this is literally a drop in the bucket. However, you think the company is understating the concern here about the radioactivity? Well, they pumped the... They needed to empty tanks on site um, because they, the, the tanks had 
concentrations of liquid that were 500 times what was permissible. But the stuff they needed to put in them was much more radioactive than that. So the 11,000 uh, tons that they pumped overboard today was to clear tanks so the more radioactive liquid could come behind it. The leak that they just fixed, though, for the last couple of, um, uh, couple of weeks has been leaking something on the order of seven tons a day, not of the 500 time concentration, but of the much more concentrated radioactivity into the, into the ocean. So there's, there's a lot of radiation in the ocean. People around the world write to Fairwinds asking why the cleanup is taking so long. And how soon will the disaster be over? Less than one week after the triple meltdown started, I was interviewed on CNN. And I said then, and I'll say it again, cleaning up Fukushima will be a long slog. While we at Fairwinds Energy Education were speaking truth to power during the first week of the meltdowns, government officials here in Europe and in Japan we're trying to convince people around the world that nothing bad had happened at TEPCO's Fukushima Daiichi site. Don't worry, be happy seemed to be the theme song around the world so that each country that owned atomic power plants could continue operating its reactors without its citizens being concerned for their own health and safety. Many FOIA, that's a Freedom of Information Act document request, given to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, have produced a series of emails from inside the NRC that show that U.S. engineers and the Commission itself knew exactly what the world was watching via the Internet and social media was a real tragedy of enormous proportions. In spite of this knowledge, throughout the world, in atomic reactor countries, government officials didn't tell anyone just how severe this calamity was. I spent almost 45 years in the atomic power industry, and I have a bachelor's and a master's degree in nuclear engineering. I was also a licensed reactor operator. I taught reactor physics at Rensselaer, and I had an Atomic Energy Commission fellowship. I also have a patent on a nuclear safety device. Well, when I was interviewed on John King on CNN on March 18th, 2011, I was the first person in America and in Japan to publicly say what many nuclear engineers, regulators, and government officials all over the world already knew. It, it has been described already. Secretary Chu today called it, Arnie, uh, worse than Three Mile Island. Uh, based on everything you know tonight, is there a chance that it will be worse than Chernobyl? I actually think it's at Chernobyl level right now. Uh, you know, you have four different reactors. Uh, a year ago, uh, the worst case imaginable was 1% fuel failure with a containment that leaked a tenth of a percent per day. That's what we thought was the worst that could happen. And now we're finding 70% fuel and a containment with a hole in the side of it. Uh, this is uh, 100 times worse than the worst case we imagined a year ago. Sobering, sobering, sobering perspective. Arnie Gunderson, Sharon Squassoni, appreciate both of you so much. Two months after I said that on the John King Show, while nuclear engineers and regulators maintained silence, then after the nuclear power industry called me a liar, Japan's government officials belatedly told the world the truth about the failure of TEPCO's Fukushima Daiichi atomic power plant. The world was finally told that the system failures and meltdowns in Japan were as bad as Chernobyl. What took them so long? As I've said all along, follow the money. As we look back on these devastating atomic power-induced tragedies, it's easy to determine the moment that both the debacle at Chernobyl began and the moments in time that TEPCO's Fukushima atomic reactors began to melt down. But now, five years later, no one knows when any of those ongoing man-made radioactive cataclysms will end. As Yogi Berra, the famous American baseball player and coach, would say, it ain't over till it's over. Sadly, Fukushima is far from being over. For me, as a nuclear engineer, it was obvious immediately after the disaster began 
as it was to many others with a similar technical background to mine, that it would take an extraordinary amount of time and a phenomenal sum of money to clean up the worst industrial calamity in human history. In February 2012, I was an invited speaker to the Foreign Correspondents Press Club in Tokyo, where I told the worldwide media, I, I believe that over the next 25 years, the um, total cleanup, especially in Fukushima Prefecture, um, will add another 190 billion US to that. So 60 billion for the plant and 190, I believe it will be about a quarter of a trillion US to uh, completely, uh, over the next 20 or 30 years, to completely clean up after this accident. As an experienced nuclear engineer and a former nuke industry corporate senior VP, I did not want to see the cover-ups and risk to families around the world that I saw after Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. Ferens and I spoke truth to power immediately in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Global Post. The two-hour interview I did with the Wall Street Journal was never published. We at Fairwinds worked unceasingly to make sure that accurate information reached the media all over the world. The saddest thing that happened to me during the last five years was to witness how the governments in Japan and the US and the worldwide atomic energy industry continue to claim that little or no radiation is impacting the people living in Japan. The truth is already beginning to make itself known. And during the next five years, the world will see a rapid increase in thyroid cancers, followed by organ cancers, hard tissue cancers, and leukemia in those exposed to the massive amounts of radiation that were released in Japan. Many of Japan's government officials continue to apply enormous pressure to doctors, to scientists, to teachers, and to journalists in order to prevent them from analyzing, discussing, and informing people about the health ramifications from such extensive and invasive radiation. Because they are so much more radiosensitive, children, especially young girls, and their mothers will be the real casualties of this disaster for decades to come. We at Fairwinds estimate that at least 100,000 and very possibly as many as a million cancers will result from this ongoing and unmitigatable atomic disaster. Tissue damage to people in Japan due to radioactive hot particles has been and continues to be completely ignored by the world's nuclear community. I was the first scientist to discuss the release of Fukushima hot particles. The ongoing radioactive legacy of hot particles will linger throughout Japan, literally, for centuries. Maggie and I and the Fairwinds crew have repeatedly been the first organization to talk about and publish information informing you about the dozens of other significant issues that other scientists and government officials in the nuclear power field have not. Some of these scientists and officials have told us that they were either afraid to discuss or they were forbidden by their corporate employer from speaking about the information we've made public with you. While we're proud to share our knowledge with you, we're also dismayed that mainstream media has failed to tell the truth about the worst industrial disaster in human history. So what did we learn from the triple meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi? First, we learned there will be more atomic reactor catastrophes in the future. Second, during the next nuclear disaster, emergency evacuation plans will fail again because government officials place atomic power profits before the health and safety of its people. Third, nuclear containment systems are absolutely incapable of enclosing and isolating radiation released as the catastrophes begin and as they continue unmitigated. Fourth, 
These prolific radiation releases will cause upwards of a million deaths, even though officials will claim that none have occurred, as they did at Chernobyl and at TMI. Fifth, the irreversible cost of atomic power to us, to you and I, the people of the world, greatly exceed any profits or any benefits that the corporate owners of nuclear power receive. Sixth, due to its triple meltdowns and the unmitigatable radioactive releases, Fukushima Daiichi will continue to bleed radiation into the Pacific Ocean for more than a century. And finally, there is no roadmap to follow with directions to stop the ongoing debacle that is Fukushima Daiichi. It will be a long slog. Renewable energy is so much safer and economically viable. With the legacy of TMI, Chernobyl, and now the ongoing calamity at Fukushima Daiichi, why is the world even considering building more atomic power plants? And with aging degraded atomic reactors, climate change induced flooding, tsunamis, hurricanes, typhoons, along with moving tectonic plates creating earthquakes worldwide, why indeed are any atomic reactors operating anywhere in the world? I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and we'll keep you informed. Thank you.